Hey y'all, Coach Nefai here, talking about the Feast of Tabernacles and exactly what we're supposed to do during the Feast of Tabernacles. And in today's class, we're going to be looking at Leviticus chapter 23, stepping down through, starting at about verse 31, looking at each verse and exactly what it says we are supposed to do during this seven or eight day long festival. Now, to make things a little bit more interesting, I'm actually going to come out of the Septuagint translation of Leviticus 23. So you may want to pull out your favorite translation because I'm thinking and even hoping that there could be some discrepancies between the two that can help make things a little bit more clear. I decided to do it this way after finding a slight difference in the words when talking about when the Feast of Passover starts and when the Feast of Atonement starts. You see right here in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5, it says in the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And then down here in verse 32, it's saying that the day of atonement starts on the ninth day of the month at even. Now, even though they're both saying even, we celebrate them at different times, as you probably know already. And when we look at the Septuagint at verse 5, when it's talking about Passover, it says between the evening times is the Lord's Passover. And then when we see down here in verse 32, it's saying from evening to evening. So those are two different times. And that's why we celebrate them differently. But we only notice that in the Septuagint. So let's use the Septuagint as we look at the festival of tabernacles. Starting there in about verse 33. First, let's open up with a prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We ask you to open up all communication pathways that we may hear your instruction on what it is that we are supposed to do during your festival of tabernacles. In your son's name we pray. Amen. And so be it. All right. So now let's look at verse 33. It says, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, so this is Moses getting the instruction it says, speak to the children of Israel, saying, on the 15th day of the seventh month, there shall be a feast of tabernacles, seven days to the Lord. Now, the Septuagint is good so far. But like I said, if you have your translation handy, look for discrepancies. I may actually miss something as I'm not planning on going back and forth. And if you see something that contradicts your translation, put it down in the comment section and let's discuss it. Now, verse 35 says, and on the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work. Now, this is important here. And I should mention how this is actually going to talk about two different festivals. When you're reading Leviticus 23, it makes it appear as though there are actually two feasts when it comes to tabernacles. They're actually described two different ways. And to me, it kind of seems like the first time it's described when we're talking about here is more for those who are new to the faith and have not been on the spiritual walk for a while. And then when we make the transition down there in about verse 37 and so on, we'll see that it describes these days as Sabbath days and actually describes different things that we are supposed to do on those days. And as part of my testimony, I'll tell you guys that it was in 2015 when I first realized that there were two different ways to celebrate this feast. Now in 2014, I had actually celebrated the second way that we're gonna see down there when we get down into about verse 39 and 40. But in 2015, I decided under my own will that I didn't fit the description of those celebrating that way. And so I decided to celebrate this way like we're about to talk about up here and I suffered negatively, I believe as a result of it. In other words, I believe that I went backwards. So be careful as we're going down through here. If you are new to the faith, what we're about to talk about here will make sense. But if you've been on this walk for a while, you may just want to listen in. You don't want to stop anything that you are doing. You don't want to go backwards and not do those things that's described down below. But anyway, Let's go on there in verse 35 is saying that there is no servile work. And so as we're talking to those who are new to the faith, this is important for them to understand. Some of them will actually be at work. 
they haven't started gaining the fruit of the land and they will still have jobs or school or different things they will have to do during the work week. And I believe that's why it's spelling it out here that they will do no servile work. This would be no hard work or the work of a servant. And me, myself, for many years, I had celebrated like this up until the year 2014, when, like I said, I transitioned and start doing it the way like we'll see below. And this is exactly what I did because I was still in a working environment, still had to go to jobs and still had to go to school. I actually did this and just didn't do any servile work. In other words, I would do things like reading training manuals or other things that didn't qualify as servile work all the time while I may have been in school studying or I may have been down at the office. I just wasn't doing any servile work to meet this requirement here. But like I said, down below it's going to say a Sabbath day. And I hope nobody gets confused. This may have should have been in two different classes. But I believe we can handle it. So let's go on. Verse 36 says, Seven days shall ye offer whole burnt offerings to the Lord. And the eighth day shall be a holy convocation to you. And ye shall offer whole burnt offerings to the Lord. It is a time of release. Ye shall do no servile work. And we just did a class here not too long ago on offerings from the book of Sirach. And some of that may apply. But again, I don't want to take away from anything anybody's doing because these burnt offerings mean different things to different people. So you can check out that video if you have no idea what a burnt offering would look like in these times. But if you think you already know, I would actually suggest that you continue doing what you already know because I'm not absolutely sure how this would look in this present time. I know what I do, but I'm not sure that it applies to everybody else. So let's just be prayed and meditated up on what exactly we're supposed to be doing in this time. And like I said, you could check out those other videos from Sirach on sacrifices and offerings. And I know I said I wasn't going to jump back and forth, but I was just curious to see what the King James Version says. And it says an offering made by fire. And that is a difference because an offering made by fire could be a peace offering like you would do at a barbecue. Whereas this burnt offering is actually a specific thing. There's a certain way that that's done. But anyway, what we see here is that these are to take place each and every day. Which makes sense because we have to eat every day. And so they could be making peace offerings, but it just stands out a little bit when it said burnt offerings. But we're going to have to handle that in another class. Let, let's go on. But then notice this part where it says it will be a holy convocation. That's meaning that it's going to be a big day. This is the day when your relatives, at least those who are walking in the faith, will want to come and spend time at your event. This is what they were doing back in the day when they all made that long trek into Jerusalem. It's because it was a holy convocation. Then notice down here in 36, it says it is a time of release. And I don't actually remember that over here in the King James Version. So curiosity has got me again. And sure enough, it doesn't say it. It says it is a solemn assembly in place of a time of release. Now, that's clearly a difference. A time of release and a solemn assembly don't seem like the same thing to me at all. So let's discuss that below. What could that mean? It sounds important. But anyway, you see that both says do no servile work. Then we get into verse 7, which is actually the transition point that we were talking about. It says, These are the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall call holy convocations to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, whole burnt offerings, and their meat offering, and their drink offerings, that for each day on its day. So now here we see that it's actually wrapping everything up. It's talking about all of the feasts of the Lord here in this verse. Again, I tell you, this is actually a transition point as it's about to describe what we are to do again on the 15th day of the month down there in verse 39. But verse 38 says, besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, 
and besides your gifts, and besides all your vows, and besides your free will offerings, which ye shall give to the Lord. Again, this is to summarize. It's saying these are the feast of the Lord. Everything that we've heard so far are the feast of the Lord, including the Sabbath days. This is the only chapter in all of the Bible that you hear about the pre-exilic feast. Now, Hanukkah and Purim are not listed here because those were feasts that were instituted after the exile. That's why they call them post-exilic feasts. But all of the other feasts that were given to Moses, we actually hear about them all in this chapter. And that's what these two verses are talking about. But anyway, look down here in verse 39 and he starts talking about the 15th day of the month again when he says, and on the 15th day of this month, when ye shall have completely gathered in the fruit of the earth, ye shall keep a feast to the Lord seven days. And on the first day, there shall be a rest. And on the eighth day, there shall be a rest. Now, throw everything out I said about not jumping back and forth. But I did want to point out how over here in the KJV, it says Sabbath instead of rest. And notice right here that it's talking about the eighth day. Now, I didn't plan on getting into dates in this video, but I did want to show you this calendar so we can understand what he's saying here. When we start the festival on the 15th day is a Sabbath or a day of rest or a day that we'll do no serve our work. We recognize that again as the Sabbath day, but we're talking about a seven day long festival. And so the seventh day will actually end up the day before the Sabbath day. And that's why it's talking about this eighth day here. The reason why I believe that the eighth day is included in here, well, one of the reasons, of course, it is the great day, but one of the reasons why I think it's spelled out is because this is a festival of booths when people will actually be sleeping in tents so or, or homemade shelters or something off in like a Jerusalem or, or maybe at their family house. But anyway, you can think on this is that these people have been sleeping in these booths away from their home and the festival is ending right here on the 21st day of the month which is the sixth day of the work week but the festival is ending at sundown which will actually be the start of the seventh day of the work week or the sabbath day so you can't really expect people to pack up all of their tents and pack up all of their gear to make that trek home because they will be leaving at the beginning even in the nighttime at the beginning of the Sabbath day. So I believe this is why our father had them to actually stay another eighth day as part of their celebration so that they would spend the Sabbath day as part of this festival that again being the eighth day. And then we read over in second Chronicles that the king actually sent them home, which would actually be the ninth day or the first day of the week. That's the day when they would have packed up all of their equipment and packed up all of their tents and families and everything and would have went back home. And we didn't mention that up there, that in verse 36, it was actually talking about the eighth day up there too, saying that it was a holy convocation. So no matter which way you celebrate, the eighth day is a big deal. They call it the great eighth day. It could be the most important day of that festival. But anyway... Looking back down here at verse 39, notice this part where it says, when you shall have completely gathered in the fruit of the earth. And that's similar to what we saw up there in verse 22, when it was talking about the feast of first fruits, the beginning of the feast of weeks. That's when they actually started the Omar count, as they call it. Notice that it says, when ye shall reap the harvest of your land. And I personally believe that this is talking spiritually here. And I think that has spiritual connotations. And I believe that's what it's talking about down here in verse 39. And that's why you hear me say, when we have been in this walk, these fruits, I believe, are a spiritual fruit. And that was my problem back there in 2004. 15 is that I did not recognize these fruits as being spiritual. So when I looked around and didn't see any fruit on the ground, any physical fruit on the ground, I got confused thinking I didn't actually fit the description of those who was actually doing this feast right here. And like I said, I made an error 
and I decided to do the festival according to what we saw up there in the previous verses and I didn't do what we're going to see down here in the following verses and I keep bringing that up because I don't want anybody to make the mistake I did it was a very 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 bad year a lot of bad things happened whereas before I saw a lot of blessings because like I said, up until 2014, even from the year 1998, when I first started keeping the feast days, I had been keeping them according to what we read up there. And it was only in 2014 that I actually followed the feast that we see down here, sleeping in booths and, and that kind of thing. And I saw a great increase in blessings. It was like after sleeping in the booth that we're going to read about, I actually felt our father's presence in a way that I had never felt in the 20 years that I had been serving the Lord before. It was a life changing experience sleeping in that booth. And I'll give you guys a video that talks about the testimony on that. It was actually a tornado involved while we were out there in a tent. And that let me know that it wasn't my house that saves me or protects me, but it was our father that did so. And so, like I said, that was a very life changing experience. But then in 2015, when I decided to not sleep in a booth, it was like all of the blessings that we had received got sucked away real quick. And we started losing things. Um, a tree fell on the car and busted the windows out. Uh, a squirrel made a nest in the motor of the truck and ate the ignition wires out of it. So there was two cars that was pretty much knocked out of commission real quick, you know, and I believe it was because I had made an error. I had backslid as far as these feast days. And like you hear me say all the time, it's all about these feast days. These feast days are extremely important to this walk. And that's why it's important that we get this right. So let's go on. And let's look at verse 40, which gives some more detail on what it is that we're supposed to do. It says, And on the first day ye shall take goodly fruit trees, and branches of palm trees, and thick boughs of trees, and willows, and branches osiers from the brook, and rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. And we see over here what trees is talking about in the King James Version. But these are the goodly trees in your area. Um, so what it's telling us to do is on the first day, the 15th day of the month, we go and we gather these branches from these trees. I myself, I gather anything I consider a goodly tree. Um, I don't necessarily have palm trees, at least not ones big enough to pull a branch off of yet. And I don't have any willows of the brook, but I do have thick trees like pecan trees and cherry trees and other beneficial trees like oak trees and pine trees and so we grab at least one branch off of each one of these trees and we walk around rejoicing with these trees we walk around the whole property just singing and rejoicing for seven days we do this just like it says there with these trees and if you get confused not understanding the importance of what's said here because you got to remember it doesn't tell us why we're doing this we're just told what to do. But if you ever get confused and wonder, OK, that, that seems, you know, not that important. I advise you to go over to Revelation chapter eight and verse nine, where it's talking about these people, this great multitude that no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. These are the people who will get to see the kingdom of heaven in the flesh. These are the people who would be standing with the hundred and forty four thousand that survived the apocalyptic events coming up on the world. Well, notice down here that they have palms in their hands. Guess what these palms are, guys? That's the Feast of Tabernacles. That's why they have palms in their hands. Just like up here, it says that they will be clothed in white robes. Of course, our robes are made white during Passover. We find out what this is saying over here is that multitude that no man can number will be those who keep these feast days correctly. It's a very big deal. Like I said, we're not really told why we're doing it, but we best believe that it is extremely important that we get this right down to the letter. And that's why we're even looking at two different translations of this book to do just that. But again, if I miss anything that's contradictory or says a little bit different, let's talk about it down in the comment section. But we do notice 
I hope you notice too how this festival is described in two different ways. Up there, we didn't hear anything about tree branches or walking around with anything, just like it didn't say Sabbath days or days of rest. It just said no servile work and holy convocations and whole burnt offerings. Down here, it's talking about walking around with tree branches, thick boughs of trees, celebrating and singing joyfully. Whereas the King James Version described that one up there as a solemn assembly, which to me sounds serious or even a little bit sad. Down here, these guys are having a joyous time, rejoicing and singing and playing and, you know, having as much fun as they can, even celebrating down there like we see in verse 41. But let's come over, over here and look at it in the Septuagint. It says, a perpetual statue for your generation in the seventh month, ye shall keep it. Now, I am mean, noticing something different here. This King James Version, verse 41 says, And ye shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statue forever in your generations. Ye shall celebrate it in the seventh month. So it's actually saying the exact same thing. They just added a few more words. So let's go on. Verse 42 says, Seven days you shall dwell in tabernacles. Every native of Israel shall dwell in tents. And this could have possibly been the problem because I am actually native Israel and I'm not necessarily grafted in like many of you guys who are listening. And that could be the separation on why I was required to sleep in a tent and why I got in big trouble when I failed to. Is it saying that those who are grafted in and not bloodline Israel do have the option to not sleep in these booths? Well, even if that be the case, guys, and you don't recognize yourself as native Israel, I personally would suggest that you go ahead and sleep in a tent because you never know. King Solomon had a thousand wives and he preferred Gentile women and Gentile women produced Gentile kids. And these kids would have spread throughout the world. And they would have all looked differently. They would have looked like their mom a little bit, but they would have still been of the bloodline of King Solomon. So in other words, some of these people who look like Gentiles are actually direct descendants of King Solomon and they would actually be native Israel. So if you feel like if our father is moving you to dwell in these booths, I would definitely do so because you could be native Israel in disguise and just not know it. Jumping back to verse 42 in the KJV, it says Israelite born shall dwell in booths. So anybody whose bloodline Israel is required to sleep in these booths. But notice up there in verse 36 that it says nothing about sleeping in the booths for the others. So and that's why I do these classes, guys. You know that these are Bible studies. I'm not preaching to you and coming in. At least I try not to come in and just act like I know everything. I've just actually learned something here in this class. I've been talking about this difference in the way we celebrate these festivals for many, many years. But what has just dawned on me is that the difference is one people is talking about those who are grafted in and the other we're talking about people who are Israelite born. And that's the difference. Praise our father in heaven. Hallowed be his name for his word and all of the understanding that he's allowing to come with it. Because, you know, that could explain why I was having a tough time about this whole walk, even before 2014. Why I kind of felt like a Gentile is because I wasn't sleeping in these booths like I did in 2014. But anyway, like I said, it is a life changing experience. And I would suggest all of you guys do it. Gentile born or not. But anyway, let's go on. Verse 43 says that your posterity may see that I made the children of Israel to dwell in tents when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I, the Lord, your God. And this is a representation, like we say, of what happened when they had to leave Egypt back there with Moses and how they had to dwell in booths for 40 years there in the wilderness. But as it mentions these old days back there, I should bring out Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 7, which is saying, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they will no more say, The Lord liveth which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. 
talking about those old times. So even till today, we tell our children and explain to them the story of Moses and how they left Egypt. But what this is saying is that's not always going to be the case. We're not always going to point to the year 1496 B.C., all those many, many years ago at that event. But it's actually going to point to a futuristic event like we read in verse eight, which says, but the Lord liveth which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all the countries whither I had driven them and they shall dwell in their own land. This is actually talking about the kingdom of heaven here and will once again go through a wilderness experience. That will be the prophetic fulfillment of atonement day when everybody on the planet will actually go through a wasteland or a wilderness experience and will have to live in tents then. That's why we're doing this dress rehearsal so we can get used to the idea of having to dwell in booths and dwell in tents because it's coming back again as we make this transition into the kingdom of heaven. And from then on, people will point back to that date and say, this is why we dwell in booths, remembering that we had to do so after the apocalypse and after the world was humbled. After that event that we hear about when that rock comes out of the sky and lands on Mount Olives and turns it into a crater. But anyway, we'll talk about that in another video. The last verse says, and Moses recounted the feast of the Lord to the children of Israel. So that sums up all that we have to do from Leviticus 23. There may be other verses in the Bible that talks about some things, some extra things that we're supposed to do. But I just wanted to get to the basics, make sure that everybody understands the basics of what it is that we're supposed to do during this time to make sure we are at least meeting the minimum requirements. If I find other requirements, I'll put them in another video. So make sure you're subscribed and make sure you have that bell notification button pushed when those videos come out. Go ahead and hit the like button if you got anything out of this video. Push the dislike button if you didn't, but leave me a comment either way. And may our Father in heaven, hallowed be his name, bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and have mercy upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.